Multiple linear regression, F test and partial F D test, multi collinearity. It's a bread and butter, baby. What's your jam? How do you do bio sixty six eleven? In this lecture, we're going to discuss multiple comparisons. We'll first introduce why multiple comparisons are a challenge in different contexts, and then discuss some practical ways of accounting for them statistically, such as through the false discovery rate. So we may find ourselves in different cases or scenarios where we wish to conduct more than one statistical test. For example, we may have an overall or global hypothesis, but we then want to do some form of post hoc testing between groups. This is a common issue in ANOVAs and represents a multiple comparisons problem. The fact that we may want to multiply compare a group to lots of other groups. In genomics or proteomics, we may wish to evaluate thousands of SNPs in a single study. And this would represent a case of a multiple testing problem where we are using the same set of data to conduct multiple tests. In the case of a clinical trial, we may define a multiple or more than one primary outcome of interest. For example, we would have then both a multiple testing and potentially comparison problem depending on what our outcome was and how we define the analysis. So we may want to say, why would this actually be problematic? Why can't I just do tests willy-nilly? Well, when we perform multiple tests, the true overall type 1 error rate is larger than the type 1 error rate for any individual test alone or we can call these concepts a family-wise and marginal type 1 error rates respectively, where sometimes we use family-wise and overall interchangeably. We can also formally state this trade-off. For example, if we set alpha our type 1 error rate to be equal to 0.05 for a single test, then we can also calculate 1 minus alpha, or the probability that we failed to reject the null hypothesis when it was actually true and that'd be equal to 0.95. In this case, if we ultimately did k tests, the family-wise type 1 error rate would be equal to 1 minus 0.95 raised to the kth power. Or in other words, as we see in the table here below, it will quickly grow from being 0.05 on that marginal or single test level to being drastically inflated. For example, if we do three different tests, we have a 14.3% chance of at least one of them being incorrectly rejected. Or if we do 50 tests, there's a over 90% chance at least one of our p-values will show up significantly less than alpha just by chance alone. And this represents the challenge if we're designing a study because if we do plan to do 50 tests but we only power ourselves for the k equals 1 case, we have this chance of making a type 1 error rate across all 50 studies or 50 tests that we wouldn't have made otherwise. So this leads us to the practical challenge of how do we address this. Although post hoc multiple comparison procedures to control the overall type 1 error rates exist, the trade-off is that they inflate the type 2 error rate. In other words, the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is true. With some appropriate software, we can actually incorporate the idea of multiple comparisons into our sample size and power calculations at the design phase, which can help to address this trade-off but honestly, at that point, we also have to note that the trade-off will generally be an increase in the sample size we need. So there is no free lunch. And this gets us to the issue that there's generally not a single correct universally true approach. If comparisons of interest are planned in advance, um, it also in general just helps to limit the comparisons to those that are the most scientifically relevant and interesting, certain procedures might be more appropriate. For example, the LSD procedure. Or if a study is exploratory or maybe hypothesis generating, we might not be worried about this issue of multiple testing or comparisons if we're really at the initial stage of a problem. So again, there's not one correct choice, but a range of possible choices to choose from. For example, here's just a selection of a few of the post hoc comparison methods that we may be able to use to make these uh, adjustments to making multiple tests or comparisons. And they're arranged in order, generally speaking, from being the least to the most conservative. For example, we have that LSD or least significant difference, which if we know in advance we wish to do, 
we can incorporate into an ANOVA in a way that is less conservative and more powerful. So in other words, minimizing the chance of making that type 2 error. We also have other ways that we'll talk a bit about in greater detail, like the false discovery rate, which is an approach to limit the proportion of false positive results at a reasonable level. Or we have ways such as the Bonferroni adjustment, which you may have heard about before, because it's very straightforward and intuitive. In the case of the Bonferroni correction, we just take C independent comparisons or tests that we're doing, and then we'll just divide our alpha level by C. So instead of 0.05 as our significance level, if we do five tests, alpha divided by five in that case is 0.01. However, this is pretty conservative, and it's especially conservative if our tests are related in some way, and we actually could account for their relationship in a meaningful pattern or system. With that broad range of possible choices mentioned before, we'll see some of them come up in greater detail when we talk about things like the ANOVA a procedure. But right now we're going to focus on how we can derive and calculate algorithmically the false discovery rate. The motivation for the false discovery rate can really be found in cases where we have many distinct hypothesis tests that we wish to perform, for example in genomic or proteomic experiments. The Bonferroni correction, which we briefly introduced on the previous slide, is sometimes used but as we noted there, it can be overly conservative, especially if we're doing hundreds or thousands of tests. To address this overly conservative approach, which does maintain the family-wise type 1 error, we can look at making a trade-off and instead control the false discovery rate, or the FDR, with the correction that's discussed in the latter part of section 12.4 of Rosner and will outline in the following slides. The general idea here is that we want to limit the number of falsely positive results to some reasonable level. For example, like 5 or 10 percent, depending maybe on what we're thinking about for a general alpha or type 1 error rate type of threshold. One limitation to note is the FDR will be more conservative if the tests are not independent. And in cases where they're not independent, we may wish to use just non-parametric methods like the permutation or bootstrap sampling of our original data to find adjusted p-values or confidence intervals to interpret over using just the FDR method to correct for p-values. One of the nice things though about the FDR algorithm is that it's pretty straightforward to calculate. At least one of the most popular algorithms known as the benjamin e hochberg is. So for example, if we're doing k different distinct tests, in step one, we'll just calculate all the p-values for the tests that we're conducting. At step two, we'll rank the comparisons in order from smallest to largest p-value, so in order of significance, statistically. We'll then calculate a quantity we'll call q, which will be equal to the number of tests k times the p-value divided by the rank order for each test. The false discovery rate value then for each test will be the minimum of the q-values for that test in all higher ranked tests. And then the null hypothesis at the end will be rejected for all FDR values that are less than some pre-specified acceptable level we wish to achieve. And I think what makes the most sense is to walk through an example of doing this by hand, as well as seeing how R and SAS can do this for us. So in our simpler FDR example, we're going to consider a case where we've conducted a study to indicate or investigate the relationship of 14 genes between cases for a given disease and controls who don't have the given disease. After we conduct our 14 tests, we see the following results here, which we have a range of p-values from this ABC gene being pretty significant, it looks like, at 0 0.0001, and we also have this MICE2 gene at 0 0.0451, but we have some extremely insignificant p-values as well, such as our 0 0.9901 for PBX3, and a bunch of values that are just above 0.05. So we may ask ourselves at this point, well, I've done 14 tests, I'm a little concerned about incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis, so I want to control for that idea of a broader overall type 1 error, or false positive. What we can do is implement that benjamin e hochberg algorithm with the sort of steps we see on the slide here. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just take our data and rearrange it so that it's in the order of those p-values from smallest to largest. And so here again we see the ABC gene has the most significant p-value and MICE2 is the second most significant. 
We then define the rank order from 1 down to 14 based on the order of the p-values. In the next column, we'll just calculate 14 times the p-value, divide it by the given rank of an observation, and so that's why we see here for the first rank we have a p-value of 0.0014, and then we also see a bunch of values in between that have quantities larger than 1. So we know at this stage we're not working with something that is distinctly a p-value which is between 0 and 1. The final step at this point is to then look at actually calculating the FDR which is based on that minimum value for the Q statistic of that rank or higher. And what you'll see here is that we actually have large chunks where we have the exact same value for the FDR. And that's because we see here out of all of these values with an FDR of 0.895, the minimum Q statistic or Q value here is this 0.895 for the 10th rank. So essentially we can just automatically fill all of those in, noting that at this point it's pretty wildly insignificant because it's a pretty large FDR. And likewise for the other two values here, we see that we have just comparisons here where the minimum is the 12th and the 14th respectively rank. At this point though, once we have our FDRs, we can look at our conclusion down below here, where we see that ABC is the only significant gene below either 5 or 10% in this case, after our false discovery rate correction. And MICE2 is no longer significant. So potentially moving forward, I might focus more on ABC and less on MICE2 or the other genes because of that correction for potentially making a false positive. One thing to note as well is that we can also do multiple corrections in R and SAS that don't involve a bunch of manual calculations or having to do a Bonferroni correction where we have to make a mental note of the adjusted p-value. In SAS, there is a proc called proc mult test where you can implement both the family-wise controlling or the FDR controlling procedures, for example, the Bonferroni, the bootstrap, the permutation tests, or the FDR versions of those. In R, there's a p-adjust function, p.adjust, which you can use to give a vector of p-values and then apply things like the Bonferroni or the FDR. The output here will represent then the adjusted p-values or FDR for your multiple comparisons. So even the Bonferroni in this case will present an adjusted p-value instead of you just thinking about comparing the raw p-value to whatever the alpha divided by the number of tests c was. Just to close with this brief example of the FDR and R, we can feed in our vector of those p-values from our example with the genes previously, and in this case we're going to just combine the estimated p-values or FDRs um, together for the two approaches for an FDR and a Bonferroni correction. When we then look at our output here, we see that again the ABC gene has that significance still, and then all of our other ones have values that are greater than point. And in fact, we can note here that the Bonferroni is in fact more conservative since it is greater than 0.3157 for the FDR at its estimated adjusted p-value of 0.6314, just illustrating that even with 14 tests, the Bonferroni can be an even more conservative test to consider. And so with that, we'll close for this initial discussion of multiple comparisons, noting it will come up a bit more later in the semester as we discuss ANOVAs and comparing multiple groups post hoc.